good morning and welcome to all, particularly all guests that are here. What a wonderful time, a wonderful day for us to come together as God's holy people on this first Sunday of Lent. It is a blessing. We're now all here together for the offering of this Mass. Please know that tomorrow night, the men of St. Benedict have their monthly meeting uh, at 7 o'clock uh, in, the, in the parish, uh, in, in the St. Scholastic Room. Bishop Condorla will be our guest speaker. So all the men of the parish are invited to attend. All the men, every man in the parish is invited to attend, to be, be, be here tomorrow night. Please also know that part of our practice is during the season of Lent, we add an extra Mass on Thursday morning. The church will be open at 6 a.m. for adoration with Mass at 6.30. Please know our evening, Friday evenings of Lent with our, our, our meatless meal, our presentation, stations the cross, then following after that. Uh, please also know we have a, just a handful of the Magnificat uh, Lenten companions still available in the commons. They're yours for the taking. Also information about the theology and court, uh, our monthly speaker series later this month, and many other things. And also you might be able to tell that our chapel is nearing completion. The altar went in on Thursday, has been assembled. The windows went in on Friday. And we're planning by the end of the month to have one of the Sundays in which would be basically an open house for everybody to see and before we begin to, using it uh, for adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Now after the, our last mass on Ash Wednesday, an observant young lady came up to me and she said, Father, why were there no bells rung during Mass? First, I complimented her upon her observation. I said, it's one of the things that we change with the liturgy during the time of Lent, that some of the beauty that the, of the, 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 around the altar we remove, that's why there's, there's no flowers or greenery in, in the sanctuary. The vestments are purple, for it's a sign of penance. So remind us that this is a special time, a time set apart, uh, the, leading to Holy Week and Easter. And Lent has its origins in the early centuries of Christianity, using the example of Jesus' 40 days uh, in the desert to fast and pray, which we hear about in today's gospel. Those who were preparing for baptism at Easter would spend 40 days of intensive prayer and fasting. And this later becomes a universal practice throughout the entire church. And today, here at this Mass in our parish, those who are praying for baptism and to make a profession of faith at the Easter Vigil will be presented and they will sign their names of the Book of the Elect and later today they will be presented to Bishop Condorla at Holy Family Cathedral in Tulsa on the rite of election. These six weeks of Lent leading to Holy Week and Easter, it's not about what we should be doing. It's not about giving up or fasting from what we should not be doing in the first place. Like we should not be fasting like, well, well if, it's, if it's too much food, too much drink, too much fill in the blank, that's not what we're particularly called to be fasting from. Rather, it is, as St. Pope Leo the Great put it, it's a time for us to do what we should be doing year-round. The prayer, the fasting from that which leads us away or distracts us from God, and also the works of mercy, whether the spiritual or the physical or corporal works of mercy. And to do them during Lent, with greater focus, with more intention, as living as disciples. Now, of course, we, we shouldn't be eating too much, drinking too much, and too much, doing too much of fill in the blank. So I'm not, don't think I'm getting like permission that after Easter, it's like, woo, okay, <laughs> you know, done, let's get back to business as usual. No, it's year round, but particularly intensified during Lent. Now, one of the great benefits, I think, of our Catholic faith is that every year there is Lent. We have an opportunity to review our seeking to live as faithful disciples. For Lent is not only, according to Leo the Great, a time of self-denial concerning food and drink, more importantly, it is the rejection of sin. And on this first Sunday of Lent, the scriptures reveal, reveal that Jesus reverses what's sometimes referred to as the sin of Adam. The sin of Adam is that we hear in the book of Genesis, also known as the fall from grace, also known as the original sin. And it has far less to do about fruit as it has to do about the temptation of being like God, of assuming to be godlike. It's the temptation to have the view that each of us has can decide for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. We call that relativism. 
If we opt into that, then basically there's no need for God to reveal divine truth to us. There's no need to seek to understand this truth to conform our lives to us. This is the sin of Adam that Jesus comes to reverse. And for this reason, Jesus is called, can be called the new Adam. He restores creation as God created it and intended it to be. Now also on this first Sunday of Lent, we acknowledge our struggle with temptation and sin as we seek to live as disciples. This is what this, our fasting and prayer should be about, that we, we're acknowledging that we have struggles in our lives, that we seek God's grace to overcome. The temptations that Jesus faces in the desert are not to deny that he's the Son of God, the Savior. Remember, the tempter, Satan, is calling him the Son of God. The temptations, rather, that he faces is that to use what God has entrusted to him for his own benefit and not for our redemption and salvation, not to reverse the sin of Adam. For salvation takes place through the cross and resurrection of Jesus. This is the reason that he was born. It is through this righteous act, as St. Paul says, we are quitted of our sins and we have the hope of salvation and eternal life. And I think the temptation that many of us so often struggle with is not to out and out deny God or the divinity of Jesus, but it's rather to trust less in God and more in ourselves. We are tempted to revert back to that sin of Adam. For those who have been washed clean in baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit, nourished with the scriptures and fed with the body and blood, soul and divinity of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, we struggle with our temptations. You see, as Catholics, we are not a once saved, always saved church. We acknowledge that as disciples, we struggle and we often fail. So each year at Lent, we renew our need for God's mercy and forgiveness through the cross and resurrection of Jesus. The temptations that Jesus faces during his 40 days in the desert or basically, I think I, I see them as a summation of the temptations that we struggle with during our entire lifetime. The first temptation is to satisfy our desire for physical pleasure and emotional need above all else. We live in a culture of self-indulgence instead of self-denial. This alone should be reason for us to fast during Lent. Dare to be different. Dare to be countercultural. Jesus rejects the temptation to turn stones into bread. It is the temptation to never know hunger, to never know poverty. It is the temptation to rely on himself and not to trust in God. Now, there was an expectation amongst the Jewish people as they were anticipating a Savior, anticipating the Messiah the Messiah would feed, would provide food and drink for all. And Jesus does feed a vast crowd more than once with a miraculous multiplication of loaves and fish. And he also mandates, he doesn't merely suggest, he doesn't merely recommend, he mandates that his disciples feed the hungry, give shelter to those in need, care for the sick, the dying, and those in prison, the works of mercy as we call them uh, as Catholics, as we should know them. But salvation is not through Jesus' miracles, no matter how amazing. It is through the cross and resurrection. It is there that our deepest desires are satisfied. It's the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of salvation. The second temptation is to chase after status the need to be the most important or the most liked. This temptation, I think, for us as disciples is often subtle. It's not, I think it's rarely in our face. It's those questions, who gets the most recognition? Who gets rewarded the most? Who is appreciated the most? And who is not? Jesus rejects this temptation to do something attention-getting and stunning, such as throwing himself off the highest point in the temple in Jerusalem. It is the temptation to make God prove 
that divine love instead of placing complete trust in that divine love. Now, there's going to come a day when Jesus will be raised up on a high place, not to do amazing attention-getting attention getting stunts, but it's to be crucified and to die on the cross. Salvation does not come through acts of wonder, but through the cross and resurrection. The third temptation is the pursuit of power and wealth. And Satan tells Jesus that all the kings, empires, domains, etc., 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 will be his with one condition that he bow down and worship at the feet of Satan. But Jesus will not allow worldly power, force, and intimidation to rule him. And as his disciples, as his holy church, neither should we. And it's worth saying, since this is an election year, nor should we allow ourselves to be manipulated by others for their political agenda. Nor should we give into the temptation that a type of salvation, one based in this world, can come through the, manip the manipulation of political power. We are not here as the church to rule the world. We are here as the church to save the world. And salvation only comes through the cross and resurrection. Whenever we allow the powers and values of this world to guide our lives instead of the gospel, guess whose feet, guess who we, who we are bowing down to and worshiping? I'll give you a hint. It is not Jesus. So once again, during Lent, we are being reminded to do what we should do throughout the year, but to do it with greater zeal, greater focus. We acknowledge our struggle with temptation and sin. We also acknowledge the new Adam, Jesus, our Savior. In these days that lead to Holy Week and Easter, may we renew our true identity as the church, redeemed and saved, the cross and resurrection of Jesus.